Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Severn Run Worship. I just have a brief announcement, uh, two brief announcements. We do have a, um, an excellent uh, experience today as a part of our worship is that we'll have um, baptism of a um, newly professing believer today, Charles, and you'll meet him in just a moment. Uh, I also will mention that I'll be hit or miss this week, although I'm not leaving. Can you bring that down a little bit? And Although I'm not leaving until Friday, um, but please know that my family and I will be out of town starting on the 17th. The Lord God has gathered us here to worship this morning, and I am pleased to be here to worship with you. Let's start with a word of prayer. Please join me. O oh God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have gathered us here in your most precious name, and we ask that in spirit and in truth you would lead us in your worship. Lord, praise and glory is due to your name. And so we ask that as you reveal yourself here in this service, that we would in fact serve you. We pray, Lord, that you would be revealed in your person, and in your works. And we ask, Lord, that you would receive our song in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, pour out your blessing on us, even in the scriptures that we read, and the preached word that we hear, and in the preached word seen in the sacrament. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for our call to worship. It's from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, and then uh, verse 1 and then verses 9 and 10. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Amen. Quite fittingly, we're now going to sing Psalm 2. So let's sing together. you 
Amen. 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 Let us behold Christ now from Acts 2. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. Amen. Behold your Christ. Let us. O oh, Lord God, we thank you for installing your Christ and for putting his names on his name upon our lips to where we may make the true profession of faith, calling him Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for reigning, us, reigning over us even now and leading us in worship. We plead with you that during our time of confession, you would work through your appointed elder, that you would lead us away from darkness and into light, just as you were doing across the whole world. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is very good to gather together in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. It's good here. We are here celebrating the goodness of our great God. And it's appropriate as we are approaching the end of Ruth and this great saga, it's appropriate for us to remember how it began. If you'll allow yourself to recall, it began with famine. It began with death. It began with a very difficult time of pain and suffering, such difficulty that caused Naomi, whose name means pleasant, to tell everyone to call her Mara, which means bitter. And we can understand why she said that. She said that because of all that she had to endure. And based on all that, we can sympathize with her statement from verse 20 in chapter 1, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Brothers and sisters, if you've been around for any amount of time, longer than just a few days, you know that there is great bitterness in this world that we can experience. There is great darkness that can come into our lives. Yet we must not give up hope. We cannot. If Naomi, or Mara, knew what God was going to accomplish for the whole world through her bitter darkness, through her suffering and her trial, can you imagine how she would have felt then? Well, brothers and sisters, we are blessed to know how the whole story ends. We know what Christ has accomplished, and we know the glorious future that is ours because of him. To help us get into this spirit of confession, I want to read for you just a few verses from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Brothers and sisters, though we may be in times of bitter darkness, we know the end result. Christ has dealt with our sin. Jesus Christ has paid the price that we owed. He has made himself our redeemer. And so as we come now, in this time of our service, to confess our sins to God, 
let us confess that though we may have bitter difficulties, we need always to be beseeching the Lord of grace at the throne of grace that he would enable us to persevere through even the trial. Sometimes the bitter darkness can cause us to forget the goodness that God has done. Let us confess our forgetfulness and beg him to give us strong and powerful memories founded on his word that know what he is doing. As is our custom here, it'll be a three-part prayer. I'll start by praying for us. Then there'll be a time of prolonged silence for you to pray in the silence of your own heart, speaking with your God. And then together we will receive from the word of God the assurance of pardon. Let us go ahead and pray and confess our sin. Gracious Lord, all around us there are things happening that we don't understand. Every day we encounter something that, if we're honest with ourselves, we would just rather hadn't happened. There are people we love who are enduring trials that we couldn't even imagine. There are days where the tears never stop. There are days where the pain doesn't go away. And there are days where we cannot look in the mirror without feeling like a failure. And yet, Lord, we cannot stay there. We have your word. We have your testimony of all that you have done. We know what you are accomplishing, not only through us, but through your church. We know that you are good. We know that you are compassionate. We know that you are long-suffering. You are full of mercy. You are steadfast in faithfulness. We know that you are true. And God, it is good that you have given us this day, your day, where we can be reminded of the truth about you, where we can remember what you are doing. We know that we forget, Lord. We know that we have short memories but we are very grateful that you, our Heavenly Father, are very patient with us and constantly reminding us of your goodness and of the goodness of your plan. We pray now, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit to move within us, to show us the areas in which we are forgetful, that we may openly confess our sin to you. We pray, dear God, hear the confession of sin of your saints. Oh God, you are awesome in all of your ways. You are indeed a wonderful and a merciful Savior. And we know, our dear God, that when we are in the midst of the difficulty, that we can cling to you. We know that you are the rock, that you are the foundation of all of our hope, of all of our joy, of all the goodness in this universe. We know, Father, that we can trust in you, for you will hold us fast. We pray, God, that you will help us always to see this. And we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, receive from the word of God, from Psalm 57, verses 1 through 3. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy 
and his truth. Brothers and sisters, this is the God that you love and the God that you serve. Let's stand and let us praise him by singing together, he will hold me fast. And now, brothers and sisters, we show our great gratitude, we show our understanding of the goodness of our God by bringing forth to him in an act of worship our tithes and our offerings. Let's sing together, brothers and sisters, the doxology. God, 
in your great wisdom, in your great love and care for us, you have given us, you have given us everything that we have. And when we are honest with ourselves, we know that it is over and above all that we could have ever asked for. Continuously, you bring us blessings that we do not deserve. Father, we recognize that you are the source of all good things. And because of what you have done in our hearts, giving us a heart of flesh that loves you, we do not fear taking our resources and giving them away. We do not fear giving what is best out of what you have given us back to you. We trust you that you will do wondrous things, wonderful and miraculous things through these, our gifts and our offerings. We pray, God, that you will give us eyes to see you at work, ears to hear the good report of what you're doing through our gifts. And we pray, Lord, that you will increase our love and our dependence upon you as we see you doing wonderful things through us and for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. We'll dismiss the children in just a bit. I figured you'd like them to be able to witness the baptism. I think that's important. And that is um, actually what we're, we're doing now. So if, if uh, Charles, if you'd like to come forward and bring anybody that you'd like, and uh, elders and deacons, if you'd like to join him up front, uh, you're welcome to do so. I'd actually encourage you to surround them if you can. You want to join? You're a deacon now. <laughs> Very good. Hey. Feeling all right? Woo, he brought everybody. Very good. I like to see that. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, everyone, this is Charles. Charles, everyone. <laughs> uh, Charles is going to make a profession of faith before you today, and then he'll be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then you have a very short time to get to know him because he's headed off to the Air Force on the 28th. Did I get that right? Yes. So you'll be in Arizona. Then you're going to tech school in Texas after that. He'll go to tech school. Yeah, in Texas. Uh, so uh, make sure he, we're going to have some cupcakes and stuff after the service. Make sure you get to know him a little bit before he heads out of town. And let's keep him um, in our prayers. We are going to have a contact point for him uh, regularly here at the church since he's heading right out. Charles, are you prepared to make your vows before God and in the presence of this congregation? All of you being here, uh, namely Charles, you're here to make a public profession of faith, and you are to assent to the following declarations and promises by which you enter into a solemn covenant with God and with His church. Charles, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving His displeasure, and without hope, except in his sovereign mercy. Amen. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation, as he is offered in the gospel? Amen. Do you now resolve and promise, in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit, that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Jesus Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Amen. And then finally, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study 
its purity and peace. Amen. Let me pray, okay? Oh Lord, we thank you for Charles. We thank you for your work in him. I thank you for all of the experiences that you have given to him and that they did not lead to total confusion and death and despair, but that you have decided to put him on a path of life and knowledge and life and uh, fruitfulness and a bright future. I pray, Lord, that you would use your sacrament to seal even onto him all of the gifts that you shall pour out onto him, that you would use this as a moment in time to sanctify his heart, that he would remain connected to you even in Arizona and in the hardships he will face in the military. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You can come on up here. You can stand right here. And then I'm going to hold you. No, I'm just I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> oh, that would be a sight. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the, we have two sacraments today. Uh, we always have the Lord's Supper. And today we also have baptism. The water, just like the supper, is both a sign and a seal. So when we say it's a sign, we mean that it's, it signifies something, it symbolizes. And it symbolizes a lot. Uh, let me just name a few. It symbolizes that before Jesus Christ, Charles was like um, someone getting ready to dry out in the desert and God is going to rain down his grace upon him in Jesus Christ and make him alive and he will bear fruit throughout his life. That's the sign. The seal or the confirmation part is that I'm going to put the water on him, which means that everything that I just said is true of Charles. Not just true in general, but true of this guy right here. God's grace, like rain on the land, has been poured out on Charles. Can you give me your full name? Charles Cruz Ridley. Charles Cruz Ridley. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 You, uh, you want to come on up here and pray? Let's pray. Our great God in heaven, we, we are marveling at yet again a good work. Not a work that Charles has done, not a work that, you, that we have done, but a work that you have done. You have, before the foundation of the world, chosen this servant, your child, to be yours. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for revealing yourself in the way that you have. We thank you for blessing us with the privilege of being able to see and get a glimpse of how it is that you work marvelously through the hearts and minds of those who would, who would run from you. Lord, you alone have changed Charles's heart. You have given him life from death. You have drawn him from deaths that no one can ever survive. We thank you for this, for this glorious picture, for your glorious work. And we pray that you would sustain him, that you would guard him against all evil, that you would give him wisdom and courage that he might be able to withstand the fiery darts that the devil would spring upon him and using the evil in the world to do the same. Give him strength and courage during these trials that you have before him. We pray that he would bear witness to the work that you have done in and through his very life. And we thank you for using all of the various families and um, resources to be able to, to bring your word to these ears and these hearts. We thank you, for we pray it all in Christ's name.
There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. And Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Let us pray. O oh Lord Christ, in your name we pray to the Father that he would glorify you, even in the preached word. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, or I pray for your congregation that you would fill them with faith and hope and love in you. I ask these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week we had a surprising message for some, and it is this. Loyal followers of Jesus Christ use the law as a wing to bring life into the world. I want to make a few observations about our passage today. I'm sure it seems a bit odd for us to, to hear about a genealogy or to preach on a genealogy, but it's not odd. So let's make some observations about it and then a couple points of application. The first thing I want you to notice is that Naomi is blessed with another son by way of Ruth. They named him Obed. In a sense, this is the apex of the story for Naomi. All of the characters, as Brad pointed out in the confession, started off empty. And as we've moved through the story arc, they're full. And this is one of those times where we can see the fullness. Naomi was empty and bitter because she had lost her husbands and her sons. Even though bread came back into the house of bread, she came back into the house of bread without any family, and so was unpleasant. Here, she has become pleasant, full, and full again, because Ruth and Boaz have supplied her with a family that will continue to grow. That's the first thing I want you to notice. The second thing I want you to notice is that the story does not end there. It could have. That would have been a nice, happy ending. 
The woman who was unpleasant, bitter, empty, is now full and pleasant and sweet. It could have been a nice, rounded-out story, but we would then miss the heart of the story if we stopped. And so as we continue, the heart of the story is actually found within a genealogy. There are two different kinds of genealogies, at least within the scriptures. One kind of genealogy is for the purpose of showing a family tree or the ancestry, so that I, for example, could point out which tribe or clan I belong to or to which I belong. But there is another kind of genealogy, and that is the one that we're dealing with this morning. The other kind of genealogy is for the purpose of legitimization and for emphasizing, therefore, the final person in the list. It's, to, it's like a beacon of hope. Look at where all of this is leading is the subtext in this genealogy. And that is the kind of ancestry we have here. Do you see the final name that is given in verses 17 and verse 22? The last name is David. The last name in the list. There's great significance to that. So let's now make another observation, observation three. The final last name is the major point of the story of Ruth. None of them would be truly pleasant or truly full or truly escape the dark days of the judges unless the family line continued into the one who was promised to be anointed to begin the Davidic dynasty. And that is what we see here. Now, there are a lot of lessons throughout the book of Ruth, but this ends up being the main lesson. It all adds up to this final name. The loyalty of Naomi, the loyalty of Ruth, the loyalty of Boaz, they are all gathered together as instruments in the hands of the Redeemer and his loyalty, and he himself is using all of them in an honorable and dignified way to arrive at this very moment where his king is appointed and the dynasty has begun. It was the Davidic dynasty that would replace the dark days of the judges and would replace emptiness and fullness. If you get time, flip to when David's reign begins after Saul is put aside and look at the summary descriptions of David. It basically says, if I were to paraphrase it, all is right and pleasant in the land. It's after he removes the Philistines especially. That's the point, is the Davidic dynasty is going to take away the bitter and he's going to make this nation pleasant. All that you saw in the book of Judges is going to start being corrected with this anointed king. And so from those observations, we can have this doctrine before us this morning, this teaching, this lesson. And here it is. God uses the loyalty of the church in his plans to establish the Davidic Messiah who will bring peace to the whole world. Hear that again. God uses the loyalty of the church in his plans to establish a Davidic Messiah who will bring peace to the whole world. Now that needs some explanation, but I'd like to unfold that in just two points. And if you're taking notes, here you go. Other genealogies and our loyalties. We'll talk under those two headings today. Other genealogies and our loyalties. Let's begin with other genealogies so that you can understand. Listen real closely to that lesson again in my emphasis. God uses the loyalty of the church in his plans to establish a Davidic Messiah who will bring peace to the whole world. That should surprise you a little bit because we actually haven't established that the David that's in that genealogy would bring peace to the whole world. How can I expand the scope from the David of the, in, who influences Israel in the Old Testament to someone that influences the entire world? And that's where, when we start to try to answer that question, we find the answer in other genealogies that are given within our scriptures, specifically genealogies in the hands of the apostles. 
So I'd like you to actually, I hope you have your Bible with you today, uh, at least on your phone or something, but let's take a look at Matthew chapter 1 together. At another time, you can look at Luke chapter 3, but today we're just going to look at Luke, or at Matthew chapter 1. I want you to notice in verse 1, it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now take a look at verse number 3. Notice, this will just be a quick observation, notice that in verse 3 we see basically the same genealogy from Ruth ending with David in verse 6. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David, the king. You're interrupted there with that extra little word, the king. Now that is where Ruth ends. But notice that the apostles, in the hands of the apostles, as they gather everything up so that you can have the full explanation, they do not end the genealogy there. Notice that you have another paragraph that is going to take you through the Babylonian exile, and then you have another paragraph consummating in verse 16, and look at the last name given in the list. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Messiah, or Christ. Here you see a genealogy, and you can look in Luke 3 for the same thing. It'll have the same genealogy from Ruth. Here you see within the apostles' hands, they are using these genealogies to make a point that the narrator of Ruth was making about David, that they're making about Jesus, who is the Christ. Now, if you were to couple this with the very final words of of Matthew, take a look at Matthew chapter 28 at the final paragraph. Y'all, some of you probably know this by heart. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Do you see what they're doing? Do you see that these are bookends making the same proclamation about the identity of who Jesus is and the point of all of the Gospels? What we witness is that the apostles used genealogies to show that Jesus is the new and the final Davidic Messiah. His kingdom will not be confined to a single locale called Israel, but spreads out over the whole world and across every nation. If you understand what Matthew is doing with the genealogies and the end of his gospel and what Luke is doing in chapter 3 with his genealogy, That is the message. That is the declaration, at least part of the declaration and proclamation of the Christian faith. Jesus Christ is the king whom God installed to be a wing to the whole world, taking away the emptiness and bitterness of every nation and giving them fullness and joy. And you are his follower. And Charles was baptized into his name, showing that Jesus Christ, even here this day, has taken emptiness and made it full in your very presence. Dryness and gave it rain. That is the Christian message that is being proclaimed when we see throughout the whole canon these connections. Now, Those are the other genealogies. And that's why within our doctrine, I can say that he is going to bring health and wholeness to the whole world and not just a locale called Israel. Because the true and the final Davidic Messiah is Jesus, who has been given authority not just over somewhere in the 
the Far East, but over every tribe and over every nation, over the whole world. If you want to see extra proof of that, look at the reading in your bulletin from Peter's sermon. Peter is just saying the same thing. It's not that David. He's dead and buried. It's this one that David himself saw in a prophetic vision, and he wrote down, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. It was a vision of the eternal Christ. Now, those are the other genealogies and the message of them, and that's the main emphasis of this book. The second thing I want to point out is not just other genealogies, but our loyalties. While we wait for Christ to return and bring all things into completion, please do not forget another major emphasis in the book of Ruth all the way to the end. And that is that God still uses the loyalty of the church to accomplish his ends. That has not stopped just because a David has been born. Protestants within our tradition are sometimes confused about this, which is why I keep beating on this drum. Due to misunderstanding, sometimes modern Reformed Protestants can be frightened to talk about the significance of our actions in today's world. They fear that we might fall into a works righteousness or something. That's okay. Don't fall into a works righteousness. But at the same time, don't give up our doctrine of the importance of what Christ is doing through us by way of his spirit. We must continue, even according to the message of Ruth, to ascribe meaning and power to our agency and our actions. Let me just give you an example. This is actually the next book we're going to hear a sermon series from. It's Titus, as we learn what it looks like to have life in the church. Titus 2, 11 through 14. Listen to this. I'm just going to give you um, part of that, but listen to this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you missed the point, here it is again. He gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, who are zealous for good works. That is also the message of Ruth is that there is a group of people who are zealous for good works. He did not say that we are just a people who look to the future and do nothing as we wait for Jesus to return. We are a people who are meant to be zealous for good works as we wait for the hope of the future. Now, why? Why would we do such a thing? Well, we gain some insight from another of Paul's teachings, and this is from 1 Corinthians 15. I'd really encourage you to meditate on that whole section. It is a huge teaching on resurrection, and then it's very interesting that Paul follows up his teaching on resurrection by focusing on your works and agency in the world. And this is what he says about it. He says, after talking about new life springing out of us by way of the Spirit, being raised from the dead... He says, this is what's on his mind. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why would I want to do that if it made no difference? Because, Paul says, you should know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul does not say, just keep looking out on the horizon. And wait for Jesus because you know what? Your actions don't really matter. Don't you know God is sovereign? Nothing you do matters. That's not a biblical message. Paul says that your labor is not in vain, which is an invocation of God's sovereignty and within his total control. 
He establishes your will and your agency that he has given to you in the Spirit. And his whole point is that our loyalty, our loyal labor, your loyal labor is not in vain, even in what he is trying to accomplish with the renewal of the entire world. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that when your young child takes apart that peanut butter and jelly sandwich and he throws the peanut butter half and sticks to the wall, that when you clean that peanut butter up in that sandwich, somehow God and his sovereignty is going to take that good work and righteous act and use it as a means to the completion of justice across the world. Now you're giggling, and I hope it's just because I look funny because what I said is totally serious. That's why as Christians, it has always been a part of our sacred tradition that humans action, human actions are exceptionally meaningful, even the smallest ones. And so within our history, we have pictures of people milking cows with joy because they see even that action has meaning in God's great world. I wasn't joking about the peanut butter sandwich. There is nothing trivial about human acts. There's nothing trivial. All acts, all thoughts, all speech shall be brought before the judgment throne of God. There's nothing trivial in human action, in our moral lives. The whole point is that our loyal labor today will in fact be used tomorrow, but you don't know how. You have to have faith and hope and love that God is going to gather all these things up and that maybe one day you'll be able to see how it all made a difference. Did Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, when they were in the middle of their lives, see that the actions, the loyal actions they were taking would result in God's plans for the installation of the Davidic Messiah? Did they see that it would result eventually in the installation of the great Messiah, Jesus Christ? The same is with us. Just as God gathered up the work of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, so too does God gather up our work. Who can speak of his wisdom and his excellencies? That's the conclusion that Paul draws in chapter 12 after he has this conversation with us in Romans. He moves into doxology, thinking about God pulling everything together for the establishment of his kingdom, every work of his people. I would encourage you to relook at Hebrews and the cloud of witnesses. Look at that as uh, those who, by way of the Spirit, are demonstrating loyalty to their God and their neighbor and how Christ is gathering all of those things up into his kingdom. God takes our good works done in Christ and by his Spirit, and like golden shimmering thread, he knits it all across from his church across the globe. He takes all of the threads and he knits the tapestry of history together, which will consummate in the full kingdom of Jesus Christ when he returns. You know, maybe a good model, I've said this a few times, maybe a good model for us to have a clear vision of just how important you are in this world, especially under the sovereignty of God, is that picture of Jesus Christ who decides to break those loaves and feed the crowds, however many thousands, depending on the account. How is it that Christ feeds the world? Let's take it symbolically like it's the world and Christ is feeding them. He's the bread of life and he's feeding those crowds. How is it that he does that? Does Jesus... Couldn't he, by way of his divine power, have, he doesn't even need to snap his fingers. But snap his fingers and then they're full. Couldn't he have had the energy to go out and give a piece of bread to every single person that was in the crowd? But that's not how he acted. He gave it to his disciples and his disciples spread it 
across the crowds, and it is the same model that is for today. People will be fed. His kingdom will grow as his disciples demonstrate loyalty under his sovereignty. Nothing has changed from Ruth even to this day. If anything, it has been more established to be the case. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you noticed that the world around us resembles the dark days of the judges? <laughs> Have you noticed famine, both literally and symbolically, in people's lives? Have you noticed that human beings feel empty and bitter? Have you noticed and witnessed the cruel treatment of children and women? I mention that because that's what we saw all the way across Judges. Are not the leaders today twisted, many leaders today twisted, and leading entire nations into a pit? Isn't that the dark days of the Judges? And what about you personally? Is not life filled with confusion and pain and loneliness and sometimes hatred of yourself, and sometimes feelings you can't explain, sometimes feelings that enrage you and quadruple the confusion? Let me ask you, what is the answer? Here's the question. What is the answer to the human condition? Not just the condition of Israel. What is the answer to the human condition? to your condition, to everybody you know, what is the answer to their condition? How will they escape the dark days of the judges? What we have seen in the book of Ruth is a twofold answer, but they come together, they dovetail. I'd encourage you to look up the wood joint called a dovetail. <laughs> the first answer is the loyalty of us, the church. Without harming justification by faith, we must believe once again that our actions and agency actually matter. We are members of the body of Christ, and our labor is not in vain. He already promised that to you, brothers and sisters. Your labor is not in vain. Don't let Satan trick you, telling you that this is all worthless, and you're, and you're wasting your time. You are polishing the brass and rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. That is not true. And the second answer, which everything else depends upon, is our loyalty of God through Jesus Christ is the answer to the human condition. God used faithfulness, the faithfulness of the faithful, to usher in the last and true Davidic Messiah, Jesus, who is the Christ. The Father has given, him all, given all authority to him, and with that authority, he sends us and he uses our work to bring the world to rights. This is the whole point, my friends. Let's rescue the Great Commission from simple-minded evangelicalism. Let's rescue the Great Commission. We do not baptize people so that they can sit around waiting on Jesus. Jesus does not give that command within that passage. He says that we are to teach them to obey everything that he has commanded. Everything that he has commanded. And God will use all of our discipleship of the nations to bring fullness and joy to all of the nations. Not apart from the final triumph of Jesus Christ. We can't just put our heads together and make this world a better place. Jesus must act. But it's not in absence of our actions either. God will use all of our discipleship of the nations to bring fullness and joy to all of the nations. None of our Great Commission labor is in vain. We could put it that way. None of our Great Commission labor is in vain. So tell me today, where are you with the Great Commission? Do you have a simple-minded evangelicalism? 
Have you narrowed down the, uh, the bubble of what's included on teach them all that I have commanded you? Have you narrowed that down to where they just read their Bibles and they say their prayers? Or does it encompass all of life under the lordship of Jesus Christ? Because when it starts to encompass all of life, what you begin to see was a sapling little plant that accepted by faith through grace the name and true identity of Jesus Christ and his work. You start to see it grow up to be this tree and spread out its branches, bringing life and fruitfulness to the world. That can happen in our own children or it can happen in our spiritual children like we saw this morning. Where do you stand with the Great Commission? Do you take your own actions and inaction seriously within this larger total vision of the world? Well, let's walk away remembering this. God uses the loyalty of the church in his plans to establish the Davidic Messiah, who is Jesus Christ, and who brings peace to the whole world. Amen. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh, Lord God, I thank you that by way of your word and your spirit, you are setting us straight this morning. Judgment begins with your church. And Lord, as we are brought under your yoke, which is light and sweet, we are able to be a witness to the world of what you are doing with the world, world without end. We ask, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would help us to have more appropriate and truthful thoughts about how you work in the world and how we work in the world. I pray that you would show us that both have power, that our agency has power by way of your power, and that you are using both to bring about your ultimate purposes. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, you have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Give us what we need as your church to go and to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. And Lord, may we never forget that, lo, you are with us till the end of the age. Amen. 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 Let's stand and respond to this gospel by singing together, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. And I ask the elders to please prepare the table. Wonderful, merciful Savior, Jesus, Redeemer, and Friend, who would have thought that Him could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one.
to your preached word. We ask, Lord, that you would inflame in us the hope of our calling. And that hope would be in you. The Savior that the Father has provided. We thank you. Amen. 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 This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us this table so that we are not left like orphans waiting for him. It is supposed to fill us with strength and comfort, the willingness to keep striving in the race as we wait for him to bring all things together, the willingness to keep doing the work that is not done in vain, even if it involves the peanut butter sandwich, all of what we would consider mundane activities. Here is the table to remind us it's all worth it. It's all coming together. He promises. And just like we saw within the baptism, these are not just general declarations. When we pass this out and you are the receiver of the bread and the wine, it is saying that you have this hope, that he is your God, that you are his people. What a beautiful seal on our hearts today. This table is not given, according to Christ himself, to just anybody. This is specifically meant for those that he has called to himself. Those who are his loyal followers. We could put it that way. If you are not a Christian, I ask that you would let the bread and the wine pass. And I would ask you to consider this this morning. If God is using all things, even your actions, whether you like it or not, for the establishment of his kingdom, would it not be far wiser on your part to ask him for mercy so that you could be on the winning team? That would be like a modern day translation of the last part of Psalm 2, where it says, kiss the sun before it is too late. Join God that none of your labor would be in vain. I encourage you to think about that. But if you're not a Christian, please let these elements pass by. The Apostle Paul gives us a warning in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who, eat, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many die. Please heed the warning. Let us pray, and then I'll begin the distribution. O oh, Father, I pray that this bread and this wine would be set apart that by faith 
your people would see the true significance of these signs. And that they would realize that as they partake, that they are members and are in reception and shall receive all of the benefits of the covenant of grace. And I pray, Lord, that as the plate, the bread or the wine passes by, I pray, Lord, that it would strike great fear in those who cannot partake, who are outside of the covenant. And that, Lord, they would run to you, seeking to know who you are, that they may profess your name in all holiness and live for you. I pray, Lord, that you would work these things as today is still today, the day of salvation. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin with the distribution of the bread. The small cup is gluten-free, if that's helpful to you. We're going to take these uh, the bread together as a family after the words of institution. For I received from the Lord that which I have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, <coughs> and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take and eat.
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us take and drink. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you have turned our bitterness into feasting. We will not suffer the wine of wrath. We will only partake in the feasting of wine. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for making all of these things possible, and we look forward to your final return. We pray, Lord, that in the in-between time, as we wait for you, may we, as the just, wait in faith. We ask, Lord, that you would come quickly. Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. <laughs> receive the Lord's benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit.